Hello everyone, welcome to Tactica Imperialis and to today's video. Oh yes, welcome back to Tactica Tutorialis, my Warhammer Science series, where I take some of the most iconic things in one of 40,000 and I suppose we could look at Age of Sigma one day, maybe, it's a bit high fantasy, but who knows, and we try to rationalise and explain them with the mighty power of science. Now today, is actually not going to be as complicated in theory as what we've been doing in the previous part. In the previous episodes, we looked at the LAS gun and we looked at the GRAV gun, and they required, well, uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity. So we're not going to be having that quite the same this time. We're going to stick to mostly classical mechanics, which is very, very good as indeed. And the topic of today is something that realistically already exists in the real world, but I wanted to explain it a bit and try and rationalise the law representation of it with what we have in the real world. Today's episode is all about the Tau Empire and their probably most iconic weapon. The Railgun. Oh yeah, we're doing rail weapons. Now, rail weapons actually already exist in the real world, and I'll explain how they work to us um, as a sort of starting point, and then we'll sort of try and bring together the law of the railgun and try and synthesize something, see what we can do. And I will definitely be leaving stuff in the description. Um, so I'll be leaving a link, I think, to CERN and to an article that I've run across that helps to explain how certain elements of what we're going to be talking about today work. I won't spoil it now. So this is going to be broken up mainly into two parts. Uh, so the first part for today is going to be our railguns. This is what railguns do in our world, how we use them, um, and how they are built, because they exist, we built them. And then two, the second part, is going to be the town railgun. What does the law say that the Tau Railgun does, and how does that mash together with what we do? This is probably going to be broken up into one or two parts. Uh, I'm not quite sure yet. I haven't actually got that far in the recording. So, we'll see exactly how this works. But I'm really looking forward to this. I've had my eye on doing this one pretty much from the start, because I thought, oh, this will be a nice, easy one. I'll just do the Railgun. How hard could the Railgun be? It already exists. Yeah, um, we'll see. We'll see. Right, so we're going to start off with how railguns work, and then we'll dive into just a little bit more of the science fiction. This is Tactica Tutorialis for the railgun. Let's get started. Okay, let's talk about railguns. How do our railguns work? Because we have got railguns. They don't, I don't think they have a military application yet, but I believe they are in R&D if they're not done already. There are railguns, and we're going to go over how they work. So, I've already pre-drawn my diagram, because it's good habits to draw your diagram. And for those wondering, yes, I have got a whiteboard of notes. It's right in front of me here. Um, this is where my whiteboard's gone. It's turned into a pile of notes because it's easier. So, here I have my diagram. I have two metallic rails here, hence the name rail gun. Two sheets of metal. I've drawn them with a bit of so a bit L-shaped. And in between sits a big metal block, this red bit. On the outside, around the back of the gun, so this is like into the gun itself, and this is the sort of barrel and the muzzle, there is a power supply. So a battery of some sort. I've drawn it with the standard battery symbol because we're doing circuits. Don't need to worry about it too much if you don't know your circuits. Basically, I have a positive side and a negative side. And in my wires, or in my system, my circuit, as it were, I have electrons, because I always have electrons, Electrons are the easiest thing to push around. And my electrons are going to flow around the circuit according to this blue arrow. They're going to flow from negative to positive. They're going to flow in that direction. Now, I know what you're thinking. Tactica, didn't you know currents flow positive to negative? Yes, dear viewer, I do know that. However, that is a misconception. That is conventional current. 
because when we discovered currents back in whatever year it was, we didn't know about electrons, so we just assumed positive to negative. That's turned out to be wrong and the other way around. So our flow is negative to positive. And to respond to a couple of comments I had from last time, people saying about the way I teach and who I'm teaching to, yes, I'm assuming you understand a little bit and want to know more, but I also have to assume that you don't know anything because you have to be treated like a class of students. So I'm going to assume very little because that's the way I've been trained to teach. So if it feels like I'm dumbing things down a bit much, that's why I'm doing it so that I get practice at teaching at that level and because I don't want to lose people in the audience who genuinely are interested but just haven't studied the science yet because maybe they're too young or, be, or for whatever reason. So we're going to teach it at that level. Sorry if you're a quantum physicist who already knows this stuff. So electrons flow from negative to positive. And now we introduce the idea of field induction. What that means is that if I have a current, which I do, I'm going to draw it up here and I'm going to call it I. Why I? Because of the French, intensité de courant. Yes, thank France. So if I have a current I, that current, by virtue of existing, will create a magnetic field. And the direction of that magnetic field is determined by that. No, I'm not kidding. The right hand rule, or one of the right hand rules, dictates that if the current is in a certain direction, the magnetic field bends around it. So for my example here, my current is upwards, so my magnetic field, I follow the curvature of my fingers, will bend around the wire like that. So my field is going to be like this. And I'm going to call that field B. So that's how that works. And we have that field induced over here. So at this point, my electrons are traveling in this direction. So you follow the curvature of your hand and you see that the field loops over the wire like that. So the field is like this. In fact, I'm gonna draw this in yellow. The field is a bit like that. So you've got it down, down, out of the page, and into the page. I'm just saying page rather than board, bear with me. So over here, I've got two little symbols. I have a cross and a dot to show the magnetic field coming into and out of the board. Uh, if I have a cross, it's like I've shot an arrow into the board. You watch it go in and you see the fletch cross at the back. It's being shot back at you. You see the arrowhead coming towards you. That's the little dot. I believe that's the reason why it looks like that. Don't need to worry about it, but they are the symbols you're going to need to know. So that's the situation on this side, on the traveling in this direction. And that means the field now curves like that. It comes under and round. So it goes a bit more like this. It goes out into the page here and out of the page here and then up like that. So that's my magnetic fields. That's B and that's B. Same field because it's the same current, current's the same everywhere in a series circuit. It's fine, don't worry about it. So I have a field now traveling out of the page here. I have a field coming out at us like this. And that's going to do something. And to do that, we need to talk about something called the Lorentz force. Spell it for you. L-O-R-E-N-T-Z. Lorentz, not Lorentz. Lorentz. And this is a force on a particle or an object inside an electromagnetic field. And it goes as follows. The force, which I'm going to do with a little arrow over its head because it's a vector, is equal to the charge times by E plus V cross B. Yep, it's a pile of letters and symbols and numbers again. Sorry, you have to get used to that. So the force is equal to the charge of the object, which will be, or in this case, the electrons probably, multiplied by the electric field, which is also induced by magnetic field. They are together, they always live together, plus the speed or the velocity, 
multiplied as a vector product, again, don't need to worry about it, multiplied by the magnetic field. We only need to worry about this bit and that bit because we're in a bracket. So Q, V cross B, that's the bit we need to worry about. And for that, we need to call upon the second of the right-hand rules, the vector right-hand rule. This thing. If you've ever sat a GCSE physics exam or an A-level physics exam, you've probably seen people doing this a lot, twiddling their hands around with these weird perpendicular symbols, or you've done it yourself. You've probably done it yourself. These weird twiddly things are how you do vector calculations. Luckily, these are all perpendicular to each other, so it works quite nicely. And you've probably heard, if not used, of Fleming's left-hand rule. We're not going to use that. You could use it, and it will work here, but we need to talk about it in terms of vectors because we are physicists and we do things properly. So, what is B? First off, easy bit. What's B? B is the magnetic field, and it is this finger here. No, it's this finger here. It is this finger here because it is V multiplied by B gives F, okay? So the product of these two is this one. I know, I know, it's a little bit awkward, and this why it's probably almost easier to do it yourself, and to be doing this with a diagram of your own, draw it on a piece of paper, do it, you'll probably get the hang of this very, very quickly, because you'll never forget it. So, V times B equals F. B is easy. B is our magnetic field, and we want to measure it for our metal block. But we know where the field's going. The field's coming out of the page. We know that already. The field is coming out of the page because we did it earlier with our induced current. The second question is, what is V? V is the velocity of the electrons. We need to consider in which direction the electrons are moving inside the metal block. And that's quite easy. They're moving upwards. So... I stick V upwards, I stick B outwards, and by completing the symbols and completing the trio, I know which direction my force is. Good, that is correct. So, field, velocity, force. The force that is resultant on our block is in that direction. The force is in that direction, and that causes it to accelerate. Remember the old formula that I think we've talked about before. If you haven't, it's the most famous equation. It's Newton's second law, F equals ma. So we have a force now acting in this direction. And because we have a mass of our object, which is whatever, the object then accelerates. So that is how a rail gun works. Your power supply induces a current because of a potential difference, induces a current, which then in turn induces a magnetic field, which then combines with that current using the Lorentz force in order to create a force in order to send it flying out of the gun and something a million miles away has a very bad day. I'm exaggerating, kind of, but you know what I mean. So that is the principle of a railgun, and this is something that we can do. I don't have one to hand because they're a little bit fiddly to make, I suspect, but that is the principle of railguns. So, you feel free to model that. I might even try and find a way to build a model of it and uh, maybe attach it to Twitter or something or maybe leave a link in the comments. I don't know, I'll see what I can do. But now I wanna talk about the actual Warhammer bit. I wanna talk about the Tau's accelerator and the Tau's railgun and see if we can rationalize this against the death machine that sits on top of a hammerhead gunship. So let's dive in. All right, Tau railguns. This is an interesting thing because the Tau's railguns seem to synthesize modern human railguns with particle accelerators technology and then add a bit more too. They're a really fascinating case study. So I'm really glad we're gonna get to talk about it. So what is a Tau railgun according to the law? Well, you have to look around a few different sources, some of the old codices, I think the siege uh, for the Taros campaign talked about it quite a bit. And what I could gather from my research is that a Tau railgun works using a couple of principles. So it is a linear 
accelerator with a solid shell, a slug, which is not actually a creepy crawly thing, it's a, like a solid shell, not a shell, a solid fully, solid all the way through block projectile. It has superconducting electrodes. Superconducting electrodes. And the other thing it has is standing wave acceleration. Standing wave acceleration. Oh, and also they're hypersonic. So this is what the law tells us a Tau rail gun is. I'm in a bit more detail on the tops of those S's. So it is a linear accelerator firing a solid slug using superconducting electrodes and standing wave acceleration. And now you need to understand what the hell all of that means. So let's start with the easy one. Linear accelerator. A linear accelerator is exactly what we had earlier. Linear just means in straight lines. So it accelerates our solid slug, our big chunk of metal probably, in a straight line. So it is point aim, where you're aiming is where it goes. There'll obviously be fluctuations due to gravity and stuff like that, but broadly, where you point it, it goes in a straight line, especially down the barrel of the gun, it goes in a straight line, linear acceleration. Easy. These two, oh, these two get into the realms of particle accelerators, which is why in the description, I'm going to leave a link to the Large Hadron Collider website on CERN, because they talk about some of this stuff, and this is essentially what's inside the Large Hadron Collider, sort of. There is elements of the Large Hadron Collider inside the Tau Railgun, which I find kind of interesting because I don't know if the first, no, no, we've had particle accelerators for far longer than we've had one, Hannah, so it's fine. Um, though I don't recall exactly when, timeline-wise, everything fitted together. Anyway, this is what we have. What this means, and we'll break this down into two parts, is we have a system that relies on resonance. This is what this standing wave bit is all about. So standing waves are actually really, really interesting and very, very simple, in fact. So at one end of our uh, chamber is a wall and at the other end is a wall. And the wave, you're just gonna have to bear with me here We have an electromagnetic wave that looks absolutely rubbish, so I'm going to have another go. Basically, an electromagnetic wave that travels along here in a straight line is reflected back and interferes with itself. So... Better. So, there is a case of reflection of the electromagnetic wave, it's fired from one end and it bounces back. And those two signals interfere with each other. Uh, you probably see this best if you had a big long piece of rope um, and you wiggled it up and down a bit. The wave sort of travels along the rope and then back along again, if you could see it, and that would cause the interference and create a standing wave pattern. You also see interference in the famous Young's double slit experiment. And if you want to see an example from history, you could have a look at, no, that's resonance. We'll get on to resonance. Um, but standing waves are everywhere. Uh, in fact, one of the most famous experiments using them is the Rubens tube, uh, which is a sound-based standing wave and a fascinating piece of kit. I've actually used one and it's really cool for creating cool fire effects. Um, people in my Discord will know exactly what I'm talking about if they want to look in one of the channels. I've actually put a video up of me pressing around with a Rubens tube. So, 
we have this reflection and that causes interference, meaning that the signal gets bigger. This, when combined with the right frequency, creates what we call resonance. Now, if you want to see resonance, you can look back into history at the old Tacoma Narrows Bridge, or Galloping Gertie, as it was called. That, I believe, was an effect of resonance. Over on a look more recently, look to the old Millennium Bridge in London, which uh, had a problem where everyone walking in step with each other was causing it to resonate and potentially damage the bridge. So they had to twiddle a few things around because of the way they built it. Resonance essentially is an amplification of the signal so that instead of being, say, this big, it's now this big. And it only happens at certain frequencies. So if I had amplitude against frequency, uh, you'd sort of see an oscillation spike, and then maybe a smaller spike. You would see resonance very particularly at a certain frequency. And this resonance is what creates the standing wave acceleration. Because when you're in resonance, what they do, and this is all explained a little bit better in some of the stuff I'm going to link in the description, so I'm glossing over it a little bit, is instead of having it with directly, it reflects and they interfere, they put them, the traveling wave and the reflected wave, deliberately out of phase with one another. So that when they actually do interfere with each other, so this wave interferes with this wave, when wave A interferes with wave B, or sorry, uh, when the traveling wave interferes with the reflected wave, they both have what we call the same phase velocity. Phase velocity and group velocity are two properties of waves. And what that means is that they're sort of desyncing from each other and the rate at which that desync and that phase, which is a really awkward word for waves, um, is traveling, not how the actual wave is moving, the speed of the wave, that's the group velocity, but the speed of the phase of the wave, so in terms of its sort of position relative to its starting position, phase is an awkward concept to explain, by the way. Feel free to add your own explanation to phase in the comments. It's much easier than me trying to do it off the top of my head right now. Um, is actually the same. It's not the same as the traveling wave's velocity. That's the group velocity, but the phase velocity is the same. And that's allowed to be greater than the speed of light, actually, which is why it's not real. It's something you can measure, but it's not a real actual speed. It's, a, it's an abstract speed, hence why it can go greater than C. Uh, but in this case, they've both got the same phase velocity, and it's traveling in the same direction. So VPR... VPT. And if they're both traveling in the same direction, that creates a push on the particle, or in our tau's case, our big block that is being accelerated and causes it to be shoved along. Now, the Hadron Collider has loads of these. It has, I think, 16 of them uh, in these cavities, these uh, radio frequency cavities. Again, I won't explain it here. Better explanations will be in the description. In essence, you have electromagnetic waves interfering, resonating with each other, and the phase velocity imparts a push onto the particle, causing them to accelerate. That is how a linear accelerator roughly, roughly works. Which leaves one bit, this bit. Superconducting electrodes. What is a superconductor? Well, superconductors are, to put it in a sentence, Things with no electrical resistance. Because of an effect called the Meissner effect, uh, they have no magnetic fields inside of them. They repel all magnetic fields from inside them. They repel all surface, all internal currents. They have surface currents, but they repel all currents and magnetism from inside them, meaning that anything you can induce within them is never dissipated. The currents that you induce inside them are permanent, and any resistance is nullified. They have no electrical resistance, meaning that the amount of energy you need to put into them 
isn't too ridiculous and you don't have to constantly keep topping it up. Um, we've been trying to use superconductors for a long, long time and we can use them. For example, we use superconductors for very high currents and magnetic fields in maglev trains. And that's probably how maglev trains in the 41st millennium also work is because of superconductors. Uh, but the main problem with superconductors as we know them is that they only operate at very, very low temperatures. And I mean really low temperatures. I'm talking a few Kelvin, which is a few degrees above absolute zero. These things really only work at cold temperatures, but there are some materials that can do superconductivity at much higher temperatures. I don't think they've quite got up to room temperature yet, but they're not far off. Uh, certainly they're getting away from needing liquid nitrogen uh, to create these superconductors. So the assumption we must therefore make is that the Tau have been able to find a material that is superconducting at very high temperatures, or their rail weapons are created such as they are basically cryogenics on the inside, cooling down the electrodes inside of them so that these junctions, the electric fields within them, can be created permanently and at a low enough temperature. One or the other, possibly both. And that's broadly how a Tau railgun kind of works. The main challenge is dealing with this and finding material that is superconducting at high temperatures so that it can deal with being, you know, inside a rifle rather than inside a ginormous dome-shaped accelerator. And the other one, interestingly enough, is the size of the object being accelerated. Because at the moment, all of this stuff exists. We have all of this inside the Large Hadron Collider, and so on and so forth. We have superconducting electromagnets, we have linear accelerators and ring accelerators, and we have the standing wave RF acceleration. We have all of this. The problem is we don't get do it to anything bigger than a proton or, you know, alpha particles. We don't do it to anything more than a few particles at once. We certainly don't do it to ginormous blocks of stuff because the way our accelerators work is that they are lots of focusing beams to steer them and point them in the right direction and push them between different things because of different magnets and all of that stuff. Again, I won't get into the details of particle accelerators here. We'll be here all day. So how the Tau have done it is that they've hybridized particle accelerator technology and put it onto a bulk scale so that their rails are super chilled so that they can be super conductive so that there is no resistance to the power supply, allowing it to work more energy efficiently. And they've also used standing waves rather than simple electromagnetic induction, which is what we did in the first part of this episode, to drive the object along, almost like a boop, 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 rather than a simple whoosh and out. Sorry, I'll, I'll do that a little bit more easy standing from one side. Our railgun, as we understand it, sit there, set it going, and off it goes, bang, straight line. This one, because of the way these standing waves work, is that you have lots of little cavities where it goes, push, 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 and out. So it speeds it up several times in little bursts, so rather than, I know I'm doing weird sound effects, bear with me, I'm not quite Bill Nye, but I'm getting there. All right, so, the tower have done some space magic in order to get from our railgun to a particle accelerator on a macro scale to work in the same way as a railgun. Quite how they've done that, I don't know. Superconducting, that way, I've already half explained they've probably found a good material for it or been able to synthesize a material that can do it. As to the cavity acceleration, well, if you look at the design of the railguns, and this actually fascinated me when I actually looked at the first railgun. Um, do I have a broadside battle suit around. Um, I do. Let me get my hammerhead or my broadside out. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm off the screen. So if you look at a railgun on a, mm, this isn't a broadside, but it'll do. So this is what a railgun looks like in Warhammer 40,000. And you can see 
there's our two rails, rail number one, rail number two. Uh, I didn't paint this, by the way, this was painted for me on uh, by a very, very, very nice person who painted me a free hamhead, and I never really paid them back, so thank you very much to that person. Anyway, um, so you can see the two rails and the barrel. So the projectile is fired down here and out of here. I therefore assume that there is a particle accelerator or an accelerator of some kind, because so they do use particle accelerators, the Tau, in particularly the bigger rail guns, they use actual particle accelerators uh, to create one thing or another. But there's a particle accelerator in here um, that, or some form of fusion power supply that is driving a ginormous current through these two rails in order to induce the magnetic fields that I mentioned earlier in order to drive the projectile out. It may also be that on the inside of these rails are little cavities that are sort of pulsing with the frequency of being reflected back and forth, and that's what's driving it along. I'm not sure, but that's my best guess. If you know better, do let me know in the comments. I'm always interested to see someone actually try and science this up a little bit more than I do, because as much as I try to do it, I know I'm going to make mistakes. But anyway, that's a rail gun. And that is the Tau Railgun, and I've been going for 17 minutes on this segment already. Now, I'm going to do one last segment before we wrap up, and that, in essence, is just how powerful is the Tau Railgun. Let's do that. All right, time to actually show some scary numbers and realize just how powerful a Tau Railgun is. So, remember what I said about a Railgun? One of the key words I haven't actually touched on yet. Hypersonic. You might have heard of supersonic or ultrasound. You might have heard of those words, but you might not have heard the word hypersonic. So hypersonic means, in essence, greater than, so the speed is greater than or equal to Mark 5. So Mark 5, for those who don't speak this sort of old language about Mark and stuff, is five times the speed of sound. Mark 1 is the speed of sound, I believe. Mark 2 is two times the speed of sound, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that means that the projectile launched by our railgun is traveling at least five times the speed of sound. I don't believe there's a word for Mark 6, but we're going to say it travels at, let's see. So speed of sound, we're going to call it C. Uh, CS is 343 meters per second. That is the speed of sound. So if you were able to fire off a sound wave, it would be heard one second later by a person 343 meters away. That's how fast sound travels, at least in air. No, vacuum, vacuum. Uh, it's not really affected by air, so it kind of works, but that's the speed of sound. So that means that our minimum speed V and a minimum is 1,715 meters per second. Wow. So that's nearly two kilometers per second at least. So you could fire a shot from a railgun, it would hit you in the head. And if you were 1.7 kilometers away, you would be dead within a second later after it was fired, and you'd hear that you were dead five seconds later. Just for context, just for context about how fast that number actually is. It's not that fast in the grand scheme of things compared to the speed of light, but it's really, 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 really fast. But it's not that fast because we can already go faster than this. Conventional Explosive projectiles can travel at roughly this speed. And modern rail guns, so I read on Wikipedia, and you can feel free to correct me on this, and maybe have some actual military data, could apparently travel about twice as fast, up to 3,000 meters per second, I believe, is the sort of speed record for a rail gun, though I could be wrong on that. But anyway, that's our minimum number. Let's round it off, because we're going to know that. And we're going to say that V is 
2,000 meters per second. We're just going to round it off a little bit to a nice round number, the nearest 1,000, which is 2,000. 2,000 meters per second. How much damage is that going to do? Well, to know that, we need to apply some very, very simple formulae. First one is the one for kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is a half mv squared. Most famous, no, certainly one of the most commonly encountered equations in low level physics up to GCSE, half mv squared. Most of you will have met that. In fact, unless you're about 13, all of you will have met this formula. I know I taught it to year nine and they're 13, 14. Um, is that right? Yeah, 13, 14. So unless you're that age, you've met this formula before. The second one we're going to need is one you meet a little bit later. Momentum. P equals MV. And the third one we're going to need is about impulse. Force is differential of momentum with respect to time. Basically, F equals MA, but slightly changed to show the force of an object when it is stopped. So sort of the, the amount of force transferred when an object stops, impulse. And we need these three formulas, but to know that we need the mass. How heavy is the shell from our railgun? How heavy is that slug? We don't know. We don't have a flipping clue because A, you need to know the dimensions of the barrel and B, you need to know what the shell is made of. Now, it's probably something magnetic and something that conducts electricity, but it actually it won't be magnetic because that would mess up with the whole fields thing. So it's probably not magnetic. It might be, but it definitely conducts electricity. We could say it's copper and then try and work out the volume of the space inside a railgun barrel, but we'd be here all year and doing what is the gaming equivalent of pixel measurements. So, no thank you. Let's say, for the sake of argument, it's one kilogram. It's probably more, probably less. One kilogram seems not a bad place to start. So, if we say, just for the sake of argument, mass is a kilogram, it's probably more than that, to be honest, but we're going to go with one kilogram. We stick that number in, and that gives us, ooh, is... 2,000 squared is 4 million times 1 times a half is about 500,000 joules. 500 kilojoules. Or a momentum, if you prefer that, of, well, quite conveniently, 2,000 kilogram meters per second. Which is a number. But then we need to work out the force that that will impart when it crashes into, say, the armor plate of our tank. Now we need to assume that it stops because it's the only way to be fair. We could say, oh, it, it loses 50% of its speed, so what's that? It's a little bit messy, but we're gonna assume it stops because it bangs into a surface, it hits an armor plate and it stops. That's the maximum force it can transfer is when it stops. So. Generally, when you bump into something and you stop, you stop basically that fast, which is probably going to be what? It's not one second. It certainly isn't going to take one second to stop if it just thuds into something. At best, tenth of a second? Let's say tenth of a second. So we stick that number in. We do P divided by T equals 20 kilonewtons. As an example, 20 kilonewtons of force. That, that's a lot of force. That is an awful lot of force. If you want to put that in weight terms or into mass terms, that is like being hit with an object. If an object was dropped on your head and it was just, oh, no, hang on. So if that's a weight, then the mass of that object is about 2,000 kilograms. That's like 2,000 kilograms worth of stuff basically just landing on you. Try and catch that. N no, that's two tons. You're going to get crushed. And the same thing is going to happen to most things it runs into. And I've picked very arbitrary and honestly very generous numbers when I've done that. One kilogram? 
No, they'll pick some ultra-dense conductive metal that will probably weigh about four times that, if not ten times that. Because, particularly in the heavy rail cannons, they don't need to worry about physically picking the thing up, they just need to worry about getting it loaded. In a normal rail rifle, that might be reasonable. So we're going to say it's a rail rifle. 0.1 second stopping time? No. Realistically, it will stop in way less time than that. It just thuds into something and transfers all of that force. It's going to do an unholy amount of damage. There's a reason the railgun is strength 10 AP1, or at least used to be strength 10 AP1, back when we had AP as that system, and not the system we have today where it's like AP minus 4. There's a reason it's got the best armor penetration value in the game. And there's a reason it does mortal wounds if you get a stricken hit. If you get a critical hit with it, but you roll a 6 to wound, it's a mortal wound or maybe more mortal wounds immediately because you're freaking dead. You've been domed, you've had a mass reactive, not really, a giant block of metal shot through your head at 6 times the speed of sound. No, you're dead. You're, you're, you're just dead. That's what makes the railgun so terrifying, and it's the reason why we're developing them. Because most bullets can't travel that fast, and even if they can, how do you get a bullet to travel that fast whilst also being fuel deficient and not so huge that it takes up a giant amount of space? Because you've got to load it up with fuel and get it to eject and fire and all of that stuff. You've got to worry about drop off and different things like that. It's a messy thing, and this is why we develop railguns. Basically, it's just how big of a battery can you make? And if you're the Tau, you've got nuclear fusion ready to go. You used to have fission, you've now got fusion. You have this technology to make your batteries, why wouldn't you? And if you want a concept of how much energy goes into firing a rail rifle, those little power cells at the back of a rail rifle, those little things that are like, sort of that shape, those things, the back of a rail rifle, look at the Tau Pathfinder, you know what I mean? Those, one of those fires a shot. One. All of that could be nuclear fusion going on. A giant power cell that's bigger than your hand. All of its energy is put into firing a railgun. With no resistance, pretty much, because of superconductors and probably because it's got it to levitate. Railguns are terrifying. Railguns are gosh damn terrifying. I steal the quote from someone else who does science on YouTube. Austin Hurain of Shoddy Gast. Brilliant show. Anyway. Railguns are goddamn terrifying, in the best possible way, and they're completely legit. Everything we've talked about today exists in our world. Railguns, particle accelerators, all they did was take one that we've got now, one that we've got now, put them together in a way we don't understand yet, and made it into a death bomb. Well done to railguns. Aren't they fun? So, that is going to be it for today's episode, and I do hope you have enjoyed it. This has been a bit more of a less deep dive crunch because trying to explain the mechanics of particle accelerators I can't do it and trying to explain um, all of the other stuff that goes with it and understanding 40k armor what it's made of and its thickness and all yada 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 there's data there but I'd be here all week trying to work out what its actual surface resistance to impact and stuff is and I couldn't be bothered so let me know what you think in the comments below add your own maths and ideas and suggestions in the comments below always interested to see what you have to say this is going to be the last tutorial of 2018, 2019, the rest of the decade, but I am going to do a tutorial special for the 30,000 subscribers when we get there. We're not there yet, but when we get there, I'm going to do tutorialis, um, and I'm probably going to do another one in the new year, though probably after I'm back here after the new year, and I've got access to my trusty whiteboard again. So I do hope you've enjoyed this. I certainly have. I knew I wanted to do the railgun, right from the start when I conceived this series, it was the, pretty much the second thing on my list until someone mentioned the grab gun and then my mind just started spinning. Um, so I knew I was gonna do this and I can't wait to do more. So let me know what you want to see and I'll see what I can do. This has been Tactica Imperialis. Thank you very much for watching Tactica Tutorialis and I'll see you all again. Bye for now.